Thank you very much, you and um, I'm very grateful for the invitation to come and, and talk to you all, although slightly embarrassed by that little potted biography. It makes me sound very busy. And um, actually, I'm secretly very lazy, and I just think if I don't keep doing things, people will notice. So I keep frantically busy so they won't tell. Um, I want to share with you today the evidence that's contained in our book about the impact of inequality and also what I think sort of underpins that relationship. Um, I'm going to share a fair amount of, of data and evidence with you and I'll try and leave time for questions so that we can have a, a bit of back and forth at the end and you can ask me anything you like. I haven't got any pockets, so I'm going to have to sort of carry this around and I'm feeling I'm going to be a bit clunky with my audiovisual. Can you hear me at the back or do I need to add another microphone? Is it okay? All right. Well, if you can't at any point, wave and I, I will try and do something about it. So not only may I not be heard, I'm actually going to start by showing you something you won't really be able to see. Um, we'll miss that one. It looks like smoke coming out of a chimney to anybody who's not in the first row. But what that smoke is, is actually the names of different countries. And what we're looking at here is the life expectancy in different countries, so plotted up the side, ranging from 40 years up to 80 and above. So it's the average life expectancy for men and women in each of those countries, plotted against national income per person. So the average income in those countries. So you've got both rich countries, um, over here on the right and poorer ones over on the left. And you can see that in sort of the poorer countries and in the early stages of economic growth, life expectancy increases very, very rapidly as countries get a little bit wealthier, as standards of living rise. But beyond a certain point, it all levels out and countries can get richer or richer, countries around here are twice as wealthy on average as, as countries here, but it doesn't affect life expectancy. People aren't living any longer. They're no longer benefiting from economic growth above a certain level of economic achievement. And if we plotted happiness up the side, the proportion of the population that are happy against this same measure of national income per person, you'd see the same curve. Above a certain level, no benefits to population happiness um, from getting richer and richer. Here are the countries that are on that sort of top part of the curve. And I hope you can see this a little more clearly. These are the countries I'm going to be talking about um, for the rest of the time. They're the rich market democracies above a certain size. And um, here we have life expectancy again, ranging from just over 75 up to just over 80 for these rich developed nations, plotted against a measure of um, national income per head, so the same thing, standard of living. And you can see that there's no relationship there whatsoever. So we've got very wealthy countries, very rich countries like Norway and the USA, um, one with quite high life expectancy, one with quite low. And over here, we've got poorer countries, um, Israel, Spain, with quite high life expectancy, um, Portugal, with very low life expectancy. So no association there between average levels of income and life expectancy. But we all know that although income doesn't seem to mean anything here between different populations, we know it's really important for health within every one of those societies. So if we just think about the UK, and here we are, we're about the middle um, for income and about the middle for life expectancy. But we know that within the UK, the wealthier, those with higher incomes, have longer life expectancy, and those who are poorer or live in the most deprived areas do not. So that's something of a paradox. Income seems to mean something within a society, but not between. And here's life expectancy again for local areas in England and Wales. So here we're running from 70 up to 80. These data are a, a few years old. And here we have the richest neighborhoods on this side and the poorest ones over here, although I seem to have lost my, my text. 
Life expectancy of 71 and a half years in the poorest areas of England and Wales and just over 79 in the richest. So a seven and a half year gap between the richest and the poorest areas. So income looks like it's very important. But it's not a threshold effect. It's not just that the poor have worse life expectancy and the rest of us are okay. It's a finely graded relationship. It's a social gradient. So that even if you live in the second most wealthy neighborhoods of all, on average your life expectancy is slightly shorter than those people who are fortunate enough to live in the very wealthiest neighborhoods. So we need to have a way of thinking about income that helps us understand why there's no relationship between average levels of income between countries, but there's a strong relationship between people's personal levels of income and their health within a society. So the important thing here is that actually what it's telling us is the importance of relative income or relative social standing, relative social status, social position, rather than the actual amounts of money or resources that you have available to us. So that's the sort of the clue. Now, not only is life expectancy unrelated to average levels of income, so are a whole host of other things that we might think of as important aspects of how well our societies are doing. Richard and I created an index. We're calling it an index of health and social well-being, which isn't very catchy, but we couldn't actually think of anything better. And it contains not only life expectancy, but also how well children are doing in school, maths and literacy scores, um, infant health, so babies dying in the first year of life, the murder rate for different countries, levels of imprisonment, levels of trust, the prevalence of obesity, levels of mental illness, and that includes drug and alcohol addiction, and social mobility. Basically, we went out to look for health and social outcomes that have those social gradients like life expectancy, so they're worse among the poorest, better among the most well-off, where we could get really good data from reliable international sources and put them all together in an index. So in this index, up the side here, if you're higher up, you're doing worse you've got more of these health and social problems. And if you're lower down, you're doing better. You have fewer of those health and social problems. So the country on here with the least of those health and social problems is Japan. The country on there with the highest is the USA, up there in the top right-hand corner. And again, this index, with all these problems weighted equally, is plotted against that measure of average income per person, and again, there's no relationship. There are rich countries with a lot of health and social problems, and rich countries with very few, and there are poor countries with a lot of health and social problems, and poorer countries with fewer. So no relationship there at all. But if we take that same index, so in the next chart, nobody's going to move on the vertical you know, if, you do, if you've got a lot of health and social problems, you're still going to come low down. And if you've got um, fewer, sorry, high up, and if you've got fewer, you're going to still come low down. So nobody's going to shift their vertical position. But if instead of plotting it against this measure of standards of living, we plot it against a measure of income inequality, the gap between the rich and the poor, we get an entirely different picture. And this actually looks more like physics than the social sciences. It is such a strong, close correlation. Here are the more equal countries at this end, Japan, Norway, Finland, Sweden, Denmark. Over here on the right, the more unequal countries, the USA, Portugal, UK, New Zealand, and Australia. And if you are, have higher level of income inequality, you have more health and social problems. Um, and it's a very close relationship right through that distribution of income inequality. So what is that measure? 
of inequality across the bottom. It's quite straightforward. Economists actually use lots of different measures of income inequality. They have lots of different ways of measuring the distribution of incomes in a society. They have something called the Gini coefficient, which has nothing to do with genies popping out of bottles. They have something called the Robin Hood index, which does have something to do with taking from the rich and giving to the poor. But this is a simple ratio. It's simply the ratio between the richest 20%, the incomes of the top 20%, and the incomes of the bottom 20%. So how much more income do the top fifth have than the bottom fifth? So it's easy to understand. And on this measure, Japan and Finland and Norway and Sweden have the top fifth have incomes that are three and a half to four times those of the bottom fifth. And in the UK, Portugal, USA, and sometimes we have data for Singapore, it's sort of seven to ten times. So on this particular measure, um, we're about twice as unequal as the countries at the more equal end. But there are countries with different levels of income inequality sort of right across. So we have mid-inequality nations as well as um, very equal and very unequal ones. And that's important because when I'm talking about the effects of inequality or the beneficial impact of greater equality, I'm not talking about some unattainable level of equality in some utopian society that has never existed on, on, on our planet. I'm talking about the differences between our rich market democracies at this historical point in time. Now we knew actually when we, well we've been working on, on, on these issues for a long time. When we sat down to write the spirit level, um, it was because we wanted to get the information out beyond an academic audience. I'm sure there are many academics in the room and you'll know that when we write research papers and publish them in peer-reviewed journals, however interesting we may think they are, they reach a very, very small selective audience, most of whom will not find them interesting. And I suppose we wrote the book because actually we got tired of shouting at the radio in the morning because it seemed like every time the media were discussing health problems or social problems, they didn't talk about inequality and we felt, you know, there's a lot of evidence there. Um, and realized it wasn't out there in, in the public domain. So that's why we wrote a book rather than more papers that nobody else would read. But we did know that it would be controversial. And we did know that the, that the overall thesis that income inequality causes health and social problems would, be, would generate um, controversy. And we were worried that actually people might think, you know, with our index of health, and social problems, that we had picked those just to sort of suit ourselves. So we did it all again with somebody else's index. And here's the index of child well-being produced by UNICEF up the side here. So now if you're near the top, you're doing better on child well-being. And if you're near the bottom, you're doing worse. And UNICEF developed this index of child well-being for rich countries. It contains 40 different aspects of child well-being. Everything from whether or not kids are immunized, to whether they can talk to their parents, to whether they like people at school, whether they're bullied, all kinds of different things. And you may remember this index because it was in the news quite a lot when it was published in 2007 because we came bottom. We have the worst child well-being in 2007 out of all of these different countries. We did quite well on one or two things in the index. We didn't do badly on everything. We're quite good at preventing um, traffic accident deaths and under, under five mortality. But we did pretty consistently badly across a whole range of things. And, and it, particularly, our young people binge drink, have sex at a very early age, and find their peers not kind or helpful and experience a lot of bullying. <coughs> So those are the sorts of things we did badly on. But if we take that index plotted against that same measure of income inequality, a significant relationship, the more equal countries have higher levels of child well-being. Take that same index, 
relate it to average incomes per head, there's nothing there. But we also thought people might think we'd selected these countries to study, to suit our argument. They're actually selected um, systematically rather than randomly or in any biased fashion. But because of that, we thought let's do it all again in a different test setting. So we looked at it again in the 50 American states. We constructed an index of social well-being for each of those 50 states containing the same or almost the same components as our international index. And here's the index of social health and social problems for those US states plotted against a measure of income inequality in each of those states. Not as tight or close a correlation, but it's statistically significant. The more unequal states, there's Mississippi, Louisiana, Alabama, New York, <coughs> with worse health and social problems than the most equal. We've got Utah, Wisconsin, Iowa, New Hampshire down there. So in two separate test settings, we see the same relationship. So let me take you through a few of those individual health and social problems. And the main reason I want to do that is to show you the scale of the differences. And I'll start with trust, because I think trust is, is a real, really key variable here. Generalized levels of trust in a society, I think, are a quite profound reflection of the social cohesion within a society, the social fabric how people get along with one another, what life feels like. These data come from the World Values Survey. They take random samples of the adult population in all of these different societies, and they ask them, do you think most people can be trusted or not? Are they out to get you? So it's quite a simple measure of generalized trust. And in the more equal societies, if you look at Sweden, Norway, Finland, Denmark, and the Netherlands up there, it's about two-thirds of the population who feel that others can be trusted. Um, the worst performing here is Portugal, where only 16% of the population feel that others can be trusted. Exactly the same in the United States. I'm not sure if I've got that slide. Yes, I have. From their general social survey, random samples of the population in the different states, and they asked them pretty much exactly the same question. Do you think most people can be trusted or not? In the more equal states, it's like those Scandinavian countries. About two-thirds of the population feel others can be trusted. And down in the more, equal, unequal, more unequal states, it is much, much lower down around a third, less than a third, Alabama, Mississippi. Again, a statistically significant relationship. So this kind of trust, I think, it really affects our lives. And I think if you imagine what it feels like to be a woman who was walking home alone at night in one of those more equal states or more equal countries compared to a woman doing the same in a much less trusting society, you could start to think how it affects daily life. If you're a young man walking out and about and you encounter another group of young men on a street corner, how does that feel? What are relationships like on the school playground? What are relationships like in public space and, and in our institutions and where we work? I think levels of trust are capturing the social fabric of a society. And it seems that it's torn apart by inequality. And an American sociologist, Eric Uslana, has done some um, what we'd call causal analyses showing that it's income inequality that leads to a destruction of generalized trust that leads to poor health and not the other way around. So let's move on to health. And I'll start with mental health. These are levels of mental illness. Um, in different countries. Um, it's the percentage of the adult population with any kind of mental illness in the previous year. Now, we used to think that it, we, you can't compare mental illness across different societies, 
because things are labelled differently, people have different access to treatment. So the World Health Organization decided to set up a consortium to actually try and measure this properly. So instead of asking people, have you felt depressed recently or have you been treated by a doctor for any kind of mental illness, they actually use what are called um, diagnostic interviews that ask about symptoms. So in relation to depression, they'll be asking about being tired or loss of appetite. Um, there'll be different questions about anxiety and other kinds of mental illness. And these are to give us a sense of the prevalence of mental illness in each of these different countries. And you can see that in the, in the most equal, rates are lower. In Japan, fewer than 1 in 10. Um, fewer than 1 in 10 in Germany, Spain, too. In the more unequal societies, rates are much higher. So 23% for the UK and for Australia, and more than 1 in 4, 26% for the USA. So over a quarter of the population having some kind of mental illness in the previous year. So the scale of the differences here is quite large. We don't have data for every country because we don't have WHO surveys done in every country. Um, but that scale is really important because again it's, it's sort of giving you a clue to the fact that the impact isn't confined to the poor. It isn't confined to a particular minority group, however defined. It's 26% of the population. It's a vast proportion of the population. <coughs> Let's move on to homicide rates. And the data I'm showing here come from colleagues in Canada. Um, and they're looking at US states in red and Canadian provinces are the blue triangles. And they're looking at the murder rate per million people. So it's how many murders are there per year per million people. And down in the more equal of these areas, which are some of the Canadian provinces, there are about 15 murders per million people per year. And in the more unequal ones, it's 150 or more. So it's a tenfold difference in the murder rate. And it's highly and significantly correlated with the level of income inequality in those different states. Here are imprisonment rates. So this has got a funny scale, this graph. And for those of you who are not mathematically minded, it's a log scale. And all that means is that the distance on this scale between 10 and 100 is the same as the distance between 100 and 1,000. And we've had to put this one on a log scale to show you, because otherwise the USA would be up off on the ceiling somewhere. So would Singapore. But you can see what a close correlation there is between the level of imprisonment in a society and a country's level of income inequality. If you know how unequal it is, you can predict its level of imprisonment except for Greece. Okay. And Greece, we feel, should actually be a little lower because a couple of them escaped. Um, they flew away from prison in a helicopter. Okay. And it was the second time they'd done it. Right. Same people, twice. I don't know if it was the same helicopter. Um, <clears throat> but actually, it may tell you something, something else important. Not only do some countries have lower rates of imprisonment, they have very, very different prison regimes. The severity of a prison regime is also associated with income inequality. We have high rates of imprisonment in some societies, not because crime rates are particularly high or are going up. Um, in the UK, our crime rates have been coming down for a number of years and our imprisonment rates have been going up and up. Your imprisonment rates go up when you are imprisoned, pe more people who come through the court system, so you choose prison sentences as opposed to community sentences, when you send them away for longer and when you have a higher recidivism rate, repeat offending. We've also, so, so you've got more punitive prisons regimes and, and um, justice systems 
in more unequal societies, harsher systems of justice. We've also looked at the age at which children are considered criminally responsible. Shows the same pattern. In more unequal societies, younger children are defined as being criminally responsible. Um, I saw some data on levels of child incarceration as well. For the state of California, for England and Wales, and for Sweden. And in the state of California, there are about 3,000 young people under the age of 18 who are locked up. There are about 3,000 young people in England and Wales as well. In Sweden, there are eight. Now, I know Sweden is a much smaller country, but actually, it's 30 times the rate of imprisonment of young people in England and Wales and the USA compared to Sweden, 30 times. And here's social mobility. Social mobility is quite hard to measure. So by social mobility, we really mean, can kids get ahead? Is there equality of opportunity? Can young people fulfill their aspirations? Or are they sort of tied into their parents' social class in some way? So it's quite hard to measure. And the measure that we're using here, we've just got high and low on, on the side, is a measure of intergenerational income mobility. Do rich parents have rich kids? Do poor parents have poor kids? Or is the income that young people achieve unrelated to their parents' income? And specifically, this is fathers and sons, because you need data over a long time period to be able to measure this. This is the correlation between a father's income when his son is born and the son's income 30 years down the road, when he's sort of grown up and established himself. And so we don't have data from many countries. We only have it from those where they've got long cohort studies or, or linked data that, that we can access. Um, and the data come from economists at the London School of Economics. But up in the more equal countries, Denmark, Finland, Sweden, Norway, Canada, Germany, there are quite high levels of social mobility. Kids' incomes are not that correlated with their parents. The UK is the lowest of all the European countries we have data for. And social mobility has been stagnant in the UK since our inequality has been rising. And here is the land of opportunity at the very, very bottom. So if you want to live the American dream, ticket to Denmark. I could go on all night showing more and more charts, but I think you get the point, really. Um, I think, in, in summary, we see associations between income inequality and health and social well-being in sort of three broad areas. One is in social relationships among people, so things like trust, as I showed you, social capital, um, how well people can sort of work together, um, imprisonment, levels of violence, um, child conflict, those sorts of things. And also in health, so drug abuse and infant deaths and life expectancy and mental illness and obesity, so a whole range of health outcomes. And then what the economists call human capital, you know, the abil ability of people in society to sort of become educated, to fulfill their aspirations, to become um, active citizens. So things like child well-being, kids dropping out of school, maths and literacy attainment in different countries, social mobility and teenage births. So all of these things significantly linked to income inequality, both across those rich countries and across the US states. But I just want to spend a few minutes showing a couple of quite complicated charts to make the point that the effects of income inequality seem to go all the way up the social gradient, all the way up the social scale, that they're not only affecting those at the bottom. Um, and I'll show you three different illustrations of that. These are infant death rates up the side here, so ranging from 0 to 15 per 1,000 babies born. 
um, and they're arranged by social class. And in Britain, we measure social class by looking at the father's occupational class. Um, here are the high social class families. Down here are the low social class families. And here are single mothers on their own, because these data come from, from birth certificates. Um, and the red bars are for England and Wales, and the blue are for Sweden. And a few epidemiologists a few years ago classified all the infant deaths in Sweden over a period of time using our social class system so that we can compare them. So a painstaking piece of work. But here at the top, very top of society, there is still an infant mortality advantage to being in more equal Sweden than in less equal England and Wales. And that goes all the way across the impact. The difference is biggest at the bottom of society, but the advantage persists all the way up. And we see the same pattern for working age deaths in Sweden, arranged by social class, compared to um, England and Wales. Something similar here for US states. The red line are death rates um, in the most unequal states. And the blue line is death rates in the most equal states. And they're arranged by how wealthy the counties are in which people are living. <coughs> so here are the most affluent counties in the US. They have about 3,000 counties. Um, and here are the poorest counties. And death rates are higher in poorer counties um, and lower in richer counties. But the slope of that relationship, the social gradient in mortality rates by county um, income is steeper. And rates are higher in the most unequal states. So at every level of county affluence, there's a mortality disadvantage to being in a more unequal state, even if you live in the richest counties of all. And one last illustration here um, in education. These are literacy scores for Sweden, the most equal of these three countries. For Canada, which comes about in the middle of the income inequality distribution, and the United States. And they're arranged, these literacy scores for young adults are arranged by how many years of education their parents have had. So a different sort of way of measuring social position or social class. And down at the end where you've got parents with the least education, there's a big difference between the educational attainment of kids in the United States, kids in Canada, and kids in Sweden. Actually, these are young adults rather than kids. But that persists all the way up, even among the children of the most educated parents. Attainment is better in more equal Sweden than in less equal Canada, and the most unequal here, the USA. So it's hard to produce these kinds of um, examples because you do need to be able to compare people in different societies at the same socioeconomic position. I have a graduate student at the moment working on a number of aspects of child well-being in more and less equal countries and looking at these slopes um, and finding a similar pattern. So what about causality? I've shown you lots and lots and lots of associations between income inequality and all kinds of bad things. So there's no doubting that there's a link there, that there's an association between them. But is it causal? If I were given a pound, or even a penny would be nice, for every time someone has said to me in the past three years, correlation doesn't prove causation, I would be such a wealthy woman that in the interest of greater equality, I would have to give a lot away and redistribute. But sadly, they didn't. So I didn't have the opportunity. Are these causal relationships? Well, in epidemiology, unlike in sort of clinical experiments, we never are able to prove things. We can't randomly assign 
half of this room to smoke cigarettes for the next 20 years and this half to not and then see whether people develop lung cancer more in this half of the room than in that half of the room. So we do observational science. All we can do is look at what is actually out there. People who actually do smoke, people who actually don't, countries that actually are more equal, countries that actually are not. And so we've had to develop ways of thinking about causality that don't rely on experimental proof. And what we end up having is a sort of a set of criteria that means we look at a whole body of evidence and try to make some kind of inference about causality. So we can't prove things, but we look at a whole range of different factors. One of the things we look at is whether or not causes precede effects, or whether or not there might be reverse causality here. Are some of these countries um, vastly unequal because their populations have a whole host of health and social problems, rather than it working the other way around? Or if income inequality changes in a society, does that affect changes in health and social problems over time? There are a number of difficulties to looking at that. Um, one is that we actually haven't had good measures of income inequality for different countries for a decent number of years. The other is it's that some of the things we're interested in, like life expectancy, we know that life expectancy is affected by your experience actually from before you're born all the way through your life. So we would expect actually changes in income inequality to have quite a long lag time before we saw changes in um, life expectancy. But there is some evidence that shows us um, temporal relationships, that, that the timing is, is, is ordered. The murder rate in US states has mirrored changes in income inequality over time. And this is one area where we might expect um, quite rapid effects of changing inequality on rates of violence. This is part of an analysis we've been doing since our book was published, um, along with a systematic review of studies that have looked at changes in income inequality and changes in crime. And we found over the literature that has been published so far a very consistent relationship when levels of inequality go up, levels of property crime and levels of homicide go up as well. When they go down, they come down. A group of researchers um, from Harvard did what's called a meta-analysis, so an analysis looking at lots and lots of different studies of income inequality in relation to health, which was published in the British Medical Journal in 2010, so after our book came out. Um, and these are their results from cohort studies. So those are studies where they've actually measured income inequality at the beginning of a time period and then followed people over time and measured changing rates of, of health or mortality rates. So these are the cohort studies where income inequality is measured first and the health outcomes come later. And for those of you um, familiar with meta-analysis and these kinds of plots, you'll know what you're looking at. For those of you who don't, this is the only interesting bit on it. This is the overall effect of um, income inequality on health in these cohort studies over all of these different studies. And there are studies from Denmark, Norway, um, Finland, New Zealand, Sweden, um, and the US. And they show that um, there is an 8% mortality increase with um, income inequality over time, a changing unit in income inequality. And these authors actually estimated how many millions of people's deaths may be attributable to income inequality in the OECD countries. And the number was too big for anybody to really believe. But it was big. And then a little bit, another sort of piece of evidence to sort of throw into the mix if we're thinking about what comes first and, and changing inequality. This is the graph I showed you earlier of our index of health and social problems against inequality. Um, and at the two ends of the distribution are Japan doing well and being very equal, and the USA 
doing poorly um, and being very unequal. If we'd taken a snapshot of these countries about 50 years ago, the USA would have been down here and Japan would have been up at the other end. The USA used to be among the most equal of, of the countries we're looking at and it used to rank very, very highly in comparison to others in terms of its health and well-being. And Japan used to be very, very unequal and had high crime rates, low um, life expectancy. And they've switched positions um, over the sort of second half of the 20th century. Our work has been, um, I will say, critiqued by others. Mostly, it's taken the form of taking our data um, and re-examining our data. Sometimes removing sets of country to see, see what happens to the relationship or, or sometimes adding others in. And I think that's, in a way, it's a mistaken approach because it acts as if the evidence that we present in the spirit level is the only evidence in the world about relationships between income inequality and health and other issues um, and doesn't address the numerous studies that are out there. There are about 200 studies of income inequality and health in peer-reviewed journals. They show this kind of relationship among the states of um, Russia. They show it among the provinces of China. They show it in Latin American countries. Um, and of course there are studies of other outcomes besides health. So Epidemiologists tend to think about um, consistency. Do we see one thing only in a certain population or do we find the same relationship in other places? I've already shown you that we find similar things in the US states to what we find um, in US countries. But other researchers you know, continue to produce um, similar kinds of evidence. Um, from Elgar and Aitken, um, income inequality and homicide in 33 different countries, a rather different set to the ones we look at. Um, and we know of well over 50 studies of inequality and homicide rates. Um, the same author looking at school bullying. Um, I think this is 37 countries and finding a much higher proportion of kids who've been bullied in the more unequal countries. And he's including countries there um, Estonia, Latvia, um, Macedonia, Turkey, ones that, w that we didn't look at. Um, and here a study of depression in 45 US states by another group. So just a few examples of the vast literature that's now out there looking at income inequality in relation to a whole range um, of different things. But coherence is important too. If we're seeing correlations between income inequality and health and social outcomes, that ought to allow us to sort of tell a coherent story about that relationship, about the causal pathways. It ought to allow us to sort of make predictions about other things. Um, and in fact, it has really, because what it, what it illustrated to us was the importance of relative social position that in societies where those differences get stretched out, where inequality increases the differences between us, stretches out the ranking, um, things ought to be worse. So measures of rank ought to sort of show up as worse in more unequal countries. And the effects of rank ought to be stronger in more unequal countries. And here, sort of fitting in with that coherent story, is a study from other researchers who've shown that self-enhancement, people's needs to sort of big themselves up, declare themselves to be better than they, well, better than average, actually. And of course, only half of them can be better than average. It's like Garrison Keillor's um, Lake Wobegon, where all of the children are above average. Um, you know that about 90% of us would say we drive better than average. Of course, we can't. But um, this is a similar measure. Do people self-enhance themselves? Do they say they're better than average on, on various things? Um, the measure of self-enhancement is up the side. And it's in relation to a measure of income inequality. 
And in the more unequal societies, people feel the need to express that, that, that they're sort of better than others. So, so this is sort of coherent with the relationships I'm showing you. Rank becomes more important. You have to sort of demonstrate um, that to yourself and to others more. And a good causal link would have predictive value. Um, we can't do experiments, but we can, if we're right, say, well, well when new data come along, they'll show um, what we thought would happen, would happen. So I'll come back to this slide now. Um, when we wrote the spirit level, these are the only data we had on mental illness in relation to income inequality. And everybody said, well, that's not really a relationship. It's all driven by the USA up there. And there's, there's, nothing, there's no information here to, to sort of draw your line. Um, but new data became available since we wrote the book. And much to our relief, it fitted in nicely, filled in that gap. And the same was true of social mobility. These were all the data we had on social mobility when we published the spirit level. And again, critics said, you can't draw a line there. You've just got two groups. There's, there's, there's nothing in the middle. And more data came along and filled in that relationship quite nicely. So really what we're left with when we've thought about um, temporal relationships, consistency of evidence, coherent stories, um, changes over time, are things like, is the relationship strong? Well, yes, it is. Um, is there sort of a dose response? Do things get more unequal? Do things get worse? Yes, they do. But what observational science is always left with, the one thing it can never answer, is the idea that there might be an alternative explanation. You know, might something else explain what's going on here? Are there other factors, apart from inequality, that might explain this relationship? And that really is where the discussion should be taking place. What other things could be explaining what I'm showing you here? If you want to have a go at it, a couple of pointers. Your alternative explanation must explain why Japan and Sweden do so well down here if it's not income inequality. They couldn't be more unalike in lots and lots of different ways. The position of women in society, how closely they keep to the nuclear family, how they get their income equality, their relative equality. Sweden does it through redistribution, taxes and benefits. Japan does it by having smaller income differences to start with, not a reliance on a welfare state. You've also got to be able to explain why Portugal is up there and Spain is over here. They're very different in their levels of income inequality. They're very different in their levels of health and social problems, and yet they share so much. They were both dictatorships for similar lengths of time and during a similar period. They have a similar degree of... Um, Catholicism, they have similar cultures. And you've got to explain what makes Portugal like the USA, apart from its level of income inequality. So it's quite a good game, actually. How, how do you explain this otherwise? Um, some I've heard are fish, eating fish, but you've got an awful lot of fish down here, and you've got an awful lot of fish up in Portugal too. Or people say small countries, Small countries do better, big countries do worse. Ooh, small countries, small country, big country, big country. Those are the two biggest of all, actually, here. Or people say, well, it's just the English-speaking countries. They're awful. Um, <laughs> so take the USA off, take the UK off, Take New Zealand off, take Australia off, take all the English-speaking countries off, you've still got a significant relationship between inequality, health and social problems. Nothing to do with English-speaking countries. Or they say, well, no, it's the Scandinavians, because they're odd. You know, they're, they're different to us. Well, you can take the Scandinavian countries off, and it still doesn't affect 
this relationship. In fact, if you want, you can take all the English-speaking countries off and the Scandinavian countries off and Japan. You've still got a statistically significant association between inequality and other things. And if you're thinking along the lines of there's something culturally different about the countries up here to the countries down here, remember you've got to explain the relationship between income inequality in the 50 US states and the health and social problems there as well. Now, obviously, my point of view is that this is the explanation. This is the causal link. But if anyone comes up with a sort of a better fit to the data and a better story of what might be going on, I'm, I will be very, very interested to hear it. So really, we're thinking it's some sort of thing to do with social position, social rank, the ways in which greater inequality makes a whole host of things worse. But can rank, can your social position, can it be so profound? Why are we so sensitive to it if it's true? I'm just going to show you before I finish one or two um, pieces of evidence. Are there any psychologists here? You do quite nasty things to people sometimes in, in the pursuit of knowledge. Um, lots of experiments, often with students. And one thing that psychologists have been interested in is um, what stresses human beings? What things stress them out the most? Um, and two psychologists from California looked at a whole range of experiments that psychologists had done trying to answer that question. What kind of stressful tasks raise stress hormones the most? They looked at, I think it was 214 different studies where people had been brought into laboratories and made to do stressful things, and then their stress hormone response is measured. And they were made to do things like um, doing difficult maths problems, um, or that's stressful enough, isn't it? I can't think of any more off the top of my head. Um, and that wasn't particularly stressful. But if they not only had to do difficult math problems, but they then had to read out their scores, or their scores were read out in public, that was stressful and sent their stress hormones up. So if we took everybody's stress hormones right now, mine would be higher than all of yours, because I'm standing up here, and you can evaluate me and judge me and think about, is she speaking well, or is she, I'm bored, you know, whereas you can all sit and relax, and I'm not judging you, promise. So my stress hormones would be high, because I'm doing a task that involves a social evaluative threat, a chance for others to judge me negatively, a chance for people to sort of see how I'm doing. Those are the things that most reliably stress us. So you can imagine that sort of rank, social position can be important, because if people are judging us, if we feel people are looking at us, that's a sort of a threat to our self-esteem. That's the potential for raising our stress hormones. So status is sort of closely linked to that. And so where we feel we are on the social ladder matters. It matters to us physiologically. Um, it matters to our health. We have a vast body of evidence in epidemiology linking social status, where you are, on a social ladder, whether it's objective or subjectively measured, to health. Um, and a colleague at Manchester, Alex Wood, has shown that your income rank, you know, where you are, if these are top incomes at the top of the ladder and bottom incomes here, where you rank predicts whether or not you develop mental distress over time. Absolute income, the amount of money you're actually getting doesn't, but your position relative to other people does. If you put them both in a model, absolute income doesn't matter at all. It's rank that predicts the development of mental distress over time. So rank affects our health. Rank affects our physiology. We are social animals acutely attuned to how other people see us. And that affects us on a very, very um, biological level. But it doesn't only affect our emotions and our health. It affects how we think as well. So one last picture, I think. These are researchers from the World Bank studying Indian boys. Um, and they brought boys 
into a test setting and they gave them puzzles to do, mazes, you know the kind where you've got to find your way in from the outside to the middle. How many could they do in a given time? And when the boys didn't know each other's cast, the high cast boys in the light blue and the low cast boys in the purple performed equally well. Then they all had to go around and say what cast they were from. Then they did their puzzles again and the performance of the low cast boys plummeted. We see the same thing with African American and white students in the United States, college and school students. If they're given tests to do, they do equally well unless they're told this is a te an intelligence test. Sort of provoking in the African American students a fear of the stereotypes that are held about them and their performance goes down when they're told that. Um, I'm afraid, ladies, we do the same with maths and spatial tests. We do just as well as the guys until someone tells us science has proven that women are not good at those sorts of tests and then our performance goes down. Actually, it's worse than that. If we just have to tick a box at the top of a test saying male, female, and we have to tick female, our performance on maths tests goes down compared to if we don't. So the way that we feel other people are judging us, the way that we think they think about us, um, has powerful effects on our bodies, on our emotions, on our minds, on the way we think. And we think these are the underpinning causal pathways that link a more unequal, hierarchical, status-driven society to this whole range of health and social problems. And that's what our next book is going to be about. <laughs> so I'll finish up. This is a cartoon we used in the book. Um, there's a guy sitting here. This is before the banking crisis. We chose it, but he does look like a banker. For reason. He's got a um, little boy sitting on his lap. And he says, it goes in cycles, Junior. Sometimes the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. Sometimes the rich get richer and the poor stay the same. That's been too true in our society for too long, but it hasn't been true forever. Data from America, the British picture looks exactly the same, changes in inequality over time. Um, this is the richest 10% um, and their share of, of income over time. America used to be very unequal, 1917 to the Great Depression, but then it became an awful lot more equal. The rich did not get richer in comparison to the poor. The poor got richer in comparison to the rich. But now inequality is run away again, and levels of inequality in the US are right back up there where they were at the beginning of the 20th century. And the picture is exactly the same in the UK as well. So we have a history of having been more equal. So does America. These aren't fixed aspects of our society that cannot change. They're not culturally entrenched. The, it was the land of opportunity once. It was somewhere you could live the American dream. We used to be as equal in the 1970s as Sweden is now. So we do have those potentials for change. Um, I'll leave that up there and go to questions. Because what can be done about it isn't my area of expertise. I have some thoughts, but you will all have thoughts as well. And our politicians and our policymakers ought to have thoughts. This part is their job, but it's our part to ask for it if we want it. So I'll finish there, and I'm sorry I've rabbited on for longer than I intended to, but I hope for those of you who want to, you'll stay and um, ask some questions. Thank you very much for listening.